and welcome to episode 110 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. And this is John Denning in Los Angeles. John, we're back for the third time in less than a week. How do you feel about it? Uh, I mean, comfortable at this point. This is starting <laughs> to feel like a habit. It is a habit. We could have <laughs> chosen a song by the artist of the night that's about habits. That would have been really good. Awesome. But since we just did this, uh, it'll be a relatively fast episode because it focused on a single topic, and that happens to be the April 22 LSAT makeup test recap. And they focus really on, on one usage. So we'll get through it pretty quickly. And since this is a redo, John. Well, more like an epi epilogue, right? Yeah, an epilogue, a postmortem mm -hmm. of a second generation here. Post postmortem. We're still going to go through all the usuals because why wouldn't you? So I need to first off ask, what are you drinking? Yeah, I'm with you on that. This can be a standalone episode, although I think you and I both agree that we wish it wasn't. I wish yeah. this had just been a natural continuation and finishing off of April. But here we are. Um, so in, uh, I suppose, homage to the fact that we're just kind of doing the same thing we did before, I'm drinking the same thing as before with a slight twist. I have tequila, but and I think I mentioned this in the last episode, a tutoring student of mine just got her final confirmation of Columbia Law School and the scholarship stuff and was quite generously uh, able to send me a good bottle of tequila. So I'm actually drinking Herodura Legend Anejo uh, on her dime, which was remarkable and I'm very, very grateful. It's always great to drink on someone else's dime. Yeah, nothing tastes I'm better down than free, right? <laughs> it is true. And I know uh, the cost on Herodur and Neho. Uh, so the legend has got to be uh, considerably more expensive. Yeah, she but, went all out. And I hope she knows that I'm grateful. I think she still tunes into these. So if she's listening to it officially, thank you. Hopefully she tunes in until she gets to Columbia and then she can you know, start focusing on what's more important. That's right. Well, I texted her last night. I think she's overseas at the moment. I was like, I'm drinking your tequila and watching random episodes of Shit's Creek on Shuffle. I was like, and I'm very, very <laughs> happy right now. Sure, she's like, that makes me happy. So. Outstanding. Well, in that kind of vein, I am also uh, drinking kind of like a reconcoction of what I had last time, which was a margarita. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what I'm drinking again. A few small changes, but really nothing of note. And mine does have Herodura regular in Neho, okay. so I'm a step down from you um, today. Yeah. Well, I don't think either of us has felt terribly lucky in the past week and a half, but we are lucky at least that the drinks we had last time are easy to repeat. Um, yeah, I, thank God I got no complaints drinking more tequila. So, <laughs> yeah, if it was like a ten-part drink, <laughs> right. uh, that would have been annoying to have to remake. But it also made our song choice relatively easy because last time when we talked about this, we said, "Hey, we've got a couple different songs about disaster, and we'll eventually be able to reuse them uh, and catastrophe and all the problems." Because the last administration had that huge technical issue, which caused a lot more people to have to do a makeup test. Mm -hmm. So we actually just went back to that list and chose one of those songs. And in this case, this is my selection. Uh, we've actually had her on the podcast before as an artist, and it's Tove Lo, and the song is a throwback to that Saturday uh, from a week and a half ago. The song is True Disaster, mm -hmm. one of my true favorites by her. Fantastic song, great video, uh, and keeping in the spirit of they screwed up on that Saturday, and now we all pay a price, and that is a true disaster. This is correct. Although, as, as people will listen to this and hear... Um, I think this was a disaster pretty well averted in the end. Um, most of what we're going to talk about today, I think, ends up being quite good news for people. I think it worked out pretty well, but the fact that it had to be worked out is yeah. where the real annoyance is. And so that's what the focus is. And we're going to keep on you know, bringing that to a highlight. 100%. But in this kind of like hyperspeed episode, John, we'll do a really abbreviated version of the LSAT world. What's the most important thing in the LSAT world right now in your mind? Well, I can tell you the most important thing in probably our collective world, which is that we have got two crystal balls coming up, uh, one for the June test, and then another just announced for the August test. So the one, it's, gosh, was it two weeks or so, almost from today? 13 days. 13 days. On the 24th of this month, May 24th, which is a Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, we're going to do a crystal ball free webinar live for the June LSAT. We'll talk about our expectations, things to focus on, priorities, things you can deprioritize a bit. We'll even give recommended problem sets during that live session uh, that people can copy or screenshot or whatever and then go study. 
Yeah, if you think of this type of episode where we recap the test, that's really a precap where we go in there beforehand and we say, all right, this is what we think is going to happen. And then later on, we can match that back up. And then, of course, there's another crystal ball for the August LSAT. Those are the next two tests, the June and the August. And that one's in July. So in 13 days, John, you and I will be on the microphones live doing that. So I'm already looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a a pretty fun event as usual. Yeah, I should put a little asterisk on this too. Because these are such unique webinars that we do, we do them rarely, but with regularity. These are the only ones that we tend to host for people where we don't provide the actual recording of the webinar after. We provide it to our students, but if you do not attend live and you're not a PowerScore student with access to a student center, you will not be able to see this. So I can't stress enough, either the need to sign up for PowerScore courses or tutoring services, or at the very least, the need to get registered for this thing and attend when it happens. And to attend, you can go to powerscore.com forward slash free seminars. Right on. So there are other things happening in the LSAT world, but we recap those on the last two episodes, which were just this week, as we mentioned. So we're going to move on and talk directly about the April makeup LSAT. And so this specifically is focused on the tests that were given on May 7th, which was a Saturday, and May 10th, which was a Tuesday. That was yesterday Yesterday. for us. And the first piece of news that we'll just remind everybody is that even though your test came after the main administration, your score release will still come out with everybody else's results. And that is May 18th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So retakers get their tests, even if it took an extra week or 10 days for you to sit and finally complete the exam itself. Yeah, I saw what I thought was a positive take on this, and I appreciated it today. I get posted, which was, you know, one upside of taking the retake on Tuesday the 10th. We only have to wait about a week for our scores. The rest of these people have been agony for 10 days longer. Yeah, and I'll remind everybody that means that LSAC can, in fact, produce results much faster than they do. Now, they give themselves some latitude because they have problems like this, and they end up having retakers on May 10th. So they they can't do it immediately after the exam, at least as far as official final scores. We've talked about kind of giving a preview score in other episodes, but this will be an eight-day turnaround from the test takers who took it yesterday. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Um, I'll address the other elephant in the room, I suppose, which is the factor that got us here. And that is the fact that the test on its second day of main administration, uh, Saturday, the whatever day it was, the first? 30th. The 30th. Thanks. Bad at calendars. But the entire system more or less imploded for several hours and prevented people either from starting the test or those who were in the middle of it from finishing. So I'll have to ask, Dave, (laughs) have we seen further instances of these types of issues? How did the two makeup days go in terms of just the smoothness of the administration? Good news is, it seems like they went well. I did not personally hear of any reports of, of problems, certainly nothing as widespread as what we had previously. It's also a smaller group, probably less than a thousand people or at a thousand people or so uh, overall. And I know on Saturday, I got a communique from LSAC that said, things are going okay and we're not seeing any problems right now. Let us know if you hear anything. And uh, I didn't. So that was good news there. Yeah, nor did I. I didn't set you up to say it was great and then me come off the horror stories. I didn't have any. Uh, So that's good. That is very good. So that actually gives us the entree very directly to get into talking about the test content. Usually there's a long list of disclaimers that I read that Mm -hmm. takes, I think, 30 to 40 minutes, but really is about less than two minutes. (laughs) And since we did that so recently, I'm not going to do the full rundown, but it does talk about how we use public information and our own uh, internal power score database to identify sections and estimate difficulty talks about our discussion of difficulty and so forth. So if you're interested in that, go back to the previous recap episode and take a look at it. The one thing I will repeat is that as usual with these type of recap episodes, we ask that you do not post a summary of the episode online. We want people to listen to this so they hear the nuance of what we say and there's no misinterpretations. So if somebody's like, I really want a summary, just be like, it's a short episode, go listen to it. Yeah, the burden of listening to this one start to finish in particular, I think is pretty low. So yeah, very, very low. This is a relatively quick exercise today, which makes our lives a lot easier, John. And on that note, probably the earliest in all time history that we actually get to discussing the content at this point so early in the episode, yeah, 
Let's open it up. I love it. I'm ready. I'm ready to wrap this up, man. I got tequila that's too good for me. <laughs> I got some, I got business to attend to. That's right. But at the moment, business for now is let's talk about what these people saw. And the first thing I'll say is that test takers on both Saturday, uh, May 7th and Tuesday, May 10th, got the same test, the same scored sections. And from what I can tell, the same experimental. Uh, it seemed almost everyone had the exact same four sections and for the most part, even in the same order. Yeah. Now it is possible that someone got a different test version, but we didn't hear from them. Mm -hmm. And so we can't really include that. So what we're going to talk about is what was the majority use, possibly everybody, but there's almost always some type of exception where they go back and they're like, oh, this person saw this and they give them a different test. If you're that person, you just need to tell us about it so we can add it to our list of understanding of this exam. But everybody that we talked to, and surprisingly, John, we talked to a lot of mm -hmm. people a lot of information. In fact, I think you and I would both make the argument that we got more information about the retake yeah. that was comprehensive and clear. And I thank everybody who sent me summaries of their test um, from the bottom of my heart. We got more of those than we did for the main administration a week earlier. And I can't tell you how much, A, we appreciate that, yeah. and B, how much easier that makes our job. We felt very confident in what we were looking at. Yeah, we've got a very good grasp on this makeup stuff, which is wonderful, but it does put it in kind of stark comparison how much we struggled through some of the domestic and international tests a week prior, uh, which we'll touch on certainly as we go. Yeah, I think sometimes people assume, oh, there's so many test takers, it won't matter. Every piece of information matters to us. And I think on the makeup, those people knew they were in a small group, so they came out in force with really detailed synopsis. Uh, of what we were seeing. And again, I always tell people the same thing. I don't want to hear about answer choices or wordings of rules or question types, that kind of stuff. You can tell me about the topics once you're done with everything and your perception of the difficulty, and then we can sort it out from there. Exactly. So, so here is what we were able to discover um, through the assistance of many people. The test that they used for both days of this makeup was first administered in February 2011. So it's a little over 11 years old, and this is an absolute favorite test that they have dusted off out of the vault many, many times uh, over the years, especially recently, which I think we can elaborate on as we go. Exactly. And I'll just add that original February 2011 usage. The reason they can reuse it, because they didn't release it. It was one of the non-disclosed February tests, so they kept it in a vault, and the they keep it in a vault for this exact purpose, to bring it back out whenever they need an exam to fill in for problems like this. Yeah. So where else have they used it then? Well, I think the biggest readministration of it, in other words, one that wasn't more or less like required or necessitated out of some emergency, was on the very first day, day one of the June 2020 Flex LSAT, uh, which is a test that we break down comprehensively in episode 58 of our podcast. So if you're curious about that test day and some of the other forms that were floating around episode 58, there you go. Um, but that's where I think we saw it in its largest reuse. And again, they didn't release it to people. It was never publicly available in 2011 nor two years ago. So it still remains viable for them to continue using. And they have. They used it again in July of 2020, so a month later, as one of the makeups for that test. They used it a couple of months later, October 2020, internationally for people. The next month, they used it, November 2020, again, for both accommodated test takers, so likely paper and pencil, and for the makeup for the November 2020 test. And we've even seen it happen this year. Uh, it came up in January 2022, so just three months ago, four months ago, for the makeup. Yeah, and it's, and those January 22 makeup people are the ones that there might be one unlucky person who had to do a makeup in January and then a makeup in April. That's the type of person who would have gotten a different exam than the one we're about to uh, recap. And if that is the case, you just need to let us know that because you will have a different uh, content set than the one that we're going to cover here. So one of the things that we saw was that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I just took a sip of that uh, margarita. <laughs> and, say, uh, that had tequila. margarita written all over it. <laughs> <laughs> it just burned my throat. I, I don't know if it was floating on the top or what. Um, so all of a sudden, it feels like my throat has been shredded. Uh, not to recall any horror stories of old past logic games. Huh. But one of the things we saw was the most common section order was opening up with reading comprehension, then having an LR section, then logic games was third and then closing with logical reasoning. So you knew at that exact point that 
uh, when you hit that four section with two LRs, one of them was experimental. And we know for a fact that the logic games and the reading comprehension that were being used were straight uh, from that February 2011 test. Well, and a little bit of a tweak in the yeah. RC that I'll talk about. But this was the content of the logic games. There were 23 questions. You had Frank and Grace, F and G, visiting cities, kind of like a travel itinerary with Houston, Montreal, Seattle, and Toronto. Then you had one that uh, is very easy to identify, yeah. two snowplows, plowing streets, um, various, uh, I think, numbers and times. Then you have kind of like an art show with five of eight paintings being selected for a gallery. And I think, John, you and I had noted that when this game was originally administered, uh, it was about five out of eight trains running. Mm -hmm. And so now the, the game is different and has either been, I think, at least partially replaced or reconfigured into paintings. And then you also had a game about a movie producer scheduling theatrical releases of seven films, uh, Vertigo, for example, and so forth. And that was your logic game section, largely similar to February 11, uh, but certainly the way it's been used in recent days. Yeah. So I remember us both scratching our heads a bit back in the June 2020, first day of the flex there, when we saw three of these topics come up that matched exactly to our February 2011 notes. We thought we knew it. But then there was this difference, this discrepancy between our notes on Feb 11, which talked about trains either running or not, and then paintings in a gallery, which we had no information on. And it became pretty clear to us after that point that they had swapped a game in. Which was funny because they did the exact same thing on the RC. Mm -hmm. And you and I'll, I'll cover that in just a moment. But imagine, you know, our job for a minute and we're like, oh, okay, they're using this February 2011, except one thing doesn't match. That's the kind of thing that really will drive you crazy in terms of like having to think about it over and over again. Because you think to yourself, well, wait, is it a different section? Is there some kind of recall? Is this entirely new? But no, it's in fact later on, just one of the games or passages was swapped out. And uh, it really is bothersome. Yeah, and so, it's tempting too, I think, at that point to start to point the finger at the memory of the test takers and be like, why are you calling this paintings? It was trains. <laughs> but of course, the guilt here lies elsewhere. They had actually made a substantive change to the content. Yeah, and I don't think LSAC is doing that to bother us. I think they do it for test you know, reasons. I think it's legitimate. I know they do a lot of stuff to bother yeah. us, or at least to thwart uh, ours and test takers' abilities to figure things out. That we've proven, I think, repeatedly. Uh, I don't think this was done for that particular reason. So let's take a look at the reading comprehension and do a similar kind of discussion here. 27 questions in this reading comp. The uh, Probably the toughest passage was a comparative about UNESCO guidelines and shipwreck treasure hunting. So you heard this you know, sunken treasure, that kind of thing being referenced. Uh, and we know that that passage is challenging the way that it is set up between the two comparative passages. Got another one about international debt and export theory, uh, also involving environmentalism. And you have one that you see widely called grammarians online, mm -hmm. about linguists preserving language and prescriptive versus descriptive interpretation of words. And then the passage that ultimately is new, although it's been around for several years, and that is about civil rights and freedom riders and some sit-ins and so forth. Mm -hmm. A lot of people call this the freedom riders passage. Interestingly, when February 2011 was originally administered, that Freedom Riders passage wasn't in this set. Instead, it was about malaria and tree bark. Yeah. Sometimes it takes us a minute to catch up on our notes. Like we knew from the last couple of L sets that it was Freedom Riders. And sometimes when we go back to the original February 2011, we're like, oh, it's malaria. And somebody's like, no, it was civil rights. But, oh, that's right. They switched it out. Yeah, definitely uh, adds some challenge to our jobs here. It's easy, too, to think like, oh, well, all they did was replace the word train with paintings. It's still five out of eight. It's the same principle in games. But this was a wholesale replacement. There was no tweaking of <laughs> malaria and tree bark to get to civil rights movement freedom riders. This was something completely different that they swapped in. Yeah, and and we don't know why they did that. There's, there's nothing, we don't know that there was a problem with the malaria and tree bark, or maybe they wanted a better balance of topics or a broader selection of topics. We don't know why they did that. Uh, ultimately, they did it though. And mm -hmm. once they made that change several years ago, it's been consistent. Yeah. So when we see the section now with the UNESCO kind of like shipwreck, sunken treasure, 
we know that it's going to have Freedom Riders these days. And I imagine that's probably a final kind of set up for as long as they continue to use this. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm much more comfortable now when someone says Freedom Riders. I'd be very confused if someone said Malaria and Tree Bark again. But if you really want to make our job tougher, if that passage had integrity and didn't have a problem, yeah. at some point it shows up on a different test. And then we're like, wait, are we looking at February 2011? <laughs> Which side are you passage? on here, Dave? <laughs> I'm, I'm on our side at all Stop times. Stop giving them ideas, man. <laughs> they already have these ideas. I think they spent a lot of their time figuring out ways to, you know, try to outmaneuver us. And that's because they couldn't outsmart us. <laughs> well, to their credit, they are pretty clever. And we're about to talk about one way. Uh, I don't think we were outsmarted, but maybe we were. Um, Wait, are you about to give an example of where we did get outsmarted? Eh. Darn. It might be too strong a phrase, or at least one I'm not quite tequila enough to be comfortable with. I don't think we were outsmarted in so much as we didn't have enough information. I think we, we were leaned, too in the dark. Um, yeah, we leaned the wrong way here. But I'm what I'm alluding you... to, of course, yeah, I'm happy to do it. You'll let me make the apology. <laughs> what I'm alluding to, of course, is logical reasoning. So games for everyone that we saw were the four. We mentioned reading comp ditto. We knew the test source for those. We knew the passage content, the games very, very clearly. Um, Logical reasoning, though, a couple of interesting things have happened, and the first of which is when we did two episodes ago our recap of the international tests, we were really struggling to collect as much information as possible about the various sections of logical reasoning given to international people. Put simply, LR has been exceptionally difficult for us to track and to identify, especially in terms of real versus experimental, when people have had more than one. And that is compounded when you see test issues come up, which tend to monopolize the conversation and dialogue and fracture groups into much smaller testing groups, which has happened here as well. So for international people and early makeup students last week, we really did struggle to get as much logical reasoning info as we had. And so in episode 108, what we suspected was the scored logical reasoning was simply the one that we had the most information on. And as I'll tell you in a minute, it turns out I think we were likely incorrect about that. We first encountered some of the logical reasoning on these makeup tests with international students last week. So we recognized it again, but this time we were able to get enough information to make a distinction, a better conclusive distinction, which I'll Yeah, and I think you and I were slightly aggravated because slightly. we were under the clear understanding that there would be no overlap between Saturday and Tuesday, the, most, the two most recent and the prior days that had gone before it, which was Friday, Saturday, and Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, our understanding was that these were completely different forms that were being used and there was no overlap. And in fact, we cleared that with LSAC because we're like, we're gonna do a podcast on this. Um, we might as well just do it for the first three days of testing. And they were like, yeah, you're good to go with that. There won't be any overlap, but there was. And there I think was. they probably just forgot is what happened. But in a different world, I think we would have waited a little bit longer and uh, then gotten confirmation. So I know that you and I were both tremendously irked, would be by description, uh, to put it diplomatically, about that when we discovered, well, we could have figured this out conclusively, but we were really guessing because we didn't have as much information as we wanted for the reasons you've explained. So sorry about that interruption. No, no, it's a, I think it's a perfect clarification and a perfect gripe, frankly. Had we been told, like, listen, if you just give it a few more days, you'll learn more we would have given it a few more days. We were told that there was going to be no duplication, no overlap, so we went ahead. Um, we wouldn't have done the podcast. Of course not. We would have waited to get more yeah, conclusive we, information, of course. I didn't, we don't want to kind of like pollute the water of, of what people know and understand and give them some kind of like advance notice of this is the exact topic and, and that kind of stuff. We're not trying to like subvert the means of the test, but in this case, we did everything right, and unfortunately, the answer we got was um incorrect yeah i don't think either one of us is prefers to speculate when there's truth available yeah and you know somebody might be like they did that intentionally no they didn't do it intentionally there's so many things going on on their side dealing with the problems i think it was just an honest mistake uh but it does mean that we we've, we've learned something from this administration in the last two days that kind of backwardly reflects and changes our opinion slightly about what was real on prior tests. It would not change the scale estimations on the prior tests, though. Glad you mentioned We'll that. say that. So yeah, I'll let I, you continue. I wouldn't change any of the matrix or the scale estimates, but this does change at least what you could, um, maybe for someone reflecting back on their test and trying to figure out how they did, this could change their own impression of it. So 
the logical reasoning that I'm about to run down, this will serve as the, quote, official power score word, I suppose, on scored content versus experimental. In some cases, it's going to actually override things that we said in the last episode. Here, then, <laughs> drum roll, is the real logical reasoning for makeup students. And if anyone else saw this previously, this was real for you as well. 25 questions, I believe, with these topics included. There was a question about honey being used to treat bacterial infections. There was a question about pre-homo sapien hunters and the use of sticks. A question about public library funding and using tax dollars. I think it had to do with the hours the library was open. Children not loving literature because they watch so much TV in their free time. A question I would love to see and a lot of people have been complaining about, about mu mesons, cosmic rays. Um, predators, I think particularly mammals, and the length of their bones, like their anatomies, I think it had to do with their elbows in particular. And some debate about new courses, I think it was a dean maybe of a school being included in next year's curriculum. All of those questions were real and should have all come from the same section. Yeah. And maybe if there's a stray question in there, it goes in the other. It's really hard when there's two LR sections like this. You're really counting on people's recall. But that section is not just real for those of you who took the makeup test. It's though it's real for anyone who had it earlier, say an international test taker who had it as well. And we've been leaning the other direction on this section when we talked about the international results beforehand, largely because we just didn't have enough information. We're like, we think this is the one. Uh, in this case, we now know that this is real. And that is because we had certain accommodated testers in this group who only had one logical reasoning section. And so able to uh, confirm that it was real without any question whatsoever. And to those people who were in that group who shared some information with us, super thanks to you. Yeah, cheers to you. Um, here then is the experimental content. And again, this is something we suspected may have been real when we first saw it last Tuesday with international tests. We now have confirmation it is experimental. If you have seen this at any point, it was not scored for you. Here are some of the question topics. Again, I think 25 questions with things like snow mountain monkeys uh, eating apples versus soybeans. I think there was another soybean question in that set about estrogen as well. Um, there was a question that we talked a little bit about last time on France versus North America, the fat consumption and the discrepant rates of heart disease between the two populations. Something Dave and I kind of referred to as the French paradox, perhaps. Yes, the wine question. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question that got a lot of attention about small versus large rats and their risks of heart disease based on size. Question about gravitational forces and orbiting planets and the structure of the sun. I imagine this probably had something to do with like the inverse square law of gravitation, mass and distance. And a question I saw people talking about very recently today, in fact, about leveling of boat ships hulls. If any or all of those match questions you can recall, that section was not scored for you. Yeah. And, you know, the, our goal here in this is always to find the ultimate truth. So... Uh, sometimes you're going to nail it. And most of the time, I think we nail it. This is the first time I was like, I think we lean the wrong way, mm -hmm. but I'd rather get it out there and be able to say, hey, this is what the goal is. The goal is to have the truth and as clarity, a real clarity of understanding, at least as much as we can determine it to be. The nice thing, as we said before, the matrix of scoring not affected whatsoever. So let's move right to the matrix yeah. then, John, because really what we have is we know that we have one logic game, one reading comprehension for everybody. You have two LR. We know which one was scored at this particular point. It's a pretty simple matrix. Um, you want to take it or you want me to take it? Since this will be the easiest one we've ever done, I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> I thought you were going to take I it. I know exactly. I could almost feel the, the relief in your eyes before I said it. That was a curveball I didn't <laughs> see coming. All right. Let's talk about the way the scoring matrix works. All right. We focus on the type of performance needed to get a 170 because it is easiest for us to estimate high level difficulty. And to estimate that, we start off with a baseline curve, so to speak, where you can miss seven questions to get a 170. And then we look at the difficulty of each section and we make a determination as to whether or not that would tighten the scale, maybe take it to six, keep it the same, so it stays at seven, or loosen it, move it to eight. One thing that we always say is we are conservative in our estimates. So if we're looking at a section where like it either has no effect or it loosens it, we're more likely to say that it has no effect. 
That way, any surprises at the end of the process are usually positive surprises where you end up with an extra point as opposed to a negative surprise where your performance is under what you expected. So starting with logic games and thinking about you can miss seven questions, minus seven for 170. As we just said, that's snow plows, paintings, movie releases, travel itinerary. This section is a medium difficulty section. Again, they're all hard. So if you struggled with this, we understand that. But on the grand schematic of logic game sections, this is not going to move the scale. It's going to keep it at essentially a zero uh, net effect here. Mm -hmm. RC, that's the shipwreck, UNESCO, export theory, grammarians, and the freedom riders. This is a tough section. This is going to loosen your scale from seven to eight. So now you could miss eight questions to get a 170. And since everybody had those two sections, uh, you know, everyone's on the same scale. And then last, the kind of section that we're not, doesn't seem to come from February 2011, but is the one about honey and bacteria. Uh, pre-homo sapien hunters, the moo messons, and predator elbows, and so forth. I heard a lot of different opinions about this, and we looked at some of the internal information that we had and the feedback from testers that we had in there, and we're going to say this does not move the scale. I think there was elements of this section where people were able to do pretty well, and I don't think it tightens the scale, but I don't think it loosens it either. And that means that everybody who had those sections is at minus eight, meaning you can miss eight questions to get a 170. Yeah. I'll say one more thing about that logical reasoning section we've now been able to pin down is confirmed real. It does seem to have been slightly easier by most, if not nearly all, reports compared to the one that we originally suspected might be real and we know now is experimental. So I think the honey and bacteria section was, uh, again, a slightly more favorable thing to have count than the snow mountain monkeys and the rats and heart disease stuff. So that's good news as well. I wasn't sad to see that. No, nor should you be. You, you know, that gives us the scale for 170. Uh, you want to break us down maybe in the 165, 160, 155 range and see how the scale would play out there? Sure. Yeah, and if you listen to an episode a couple of episodes ago for the first batch of April test takers, you've heard me do this, and you heard me do it specifically to minus eight scales for a 170, because most of the various combinations we've seen have been a minus eight, which is good. It means there's a fairly consistent degree of difficulty regardless of when you took this test. But here's how I see this minus eight scale shaking out a little lower down in the scoring. A 165, I would imagine you can miss 13. So assuming there were 20, or sorry, 25 LR questions, 62 total correct for 165. A 160, I'd say you could probably miss 19, which means you need to get about 56 correct. And a 155, you could miss 28. So around 47 correct for that score. And that's it. There you go. I'm glad I let you do it, man, because you handled that with a plum, graceful. And so this test goes out, in the words of T.S. Eliot, not with a bang, but a whimper. It's so ended on these makeup tests. And uh, I think nice for the vast majority, or at least all the people that we heard from, they now know that they're looking at a minus eight scale, that their test was pretty reasonable. Doesn't mean that they, you know, that every single person performed great. I saw more than one person say, those games weren't hard, but I screwed them up. That happens. Mm -hmm. Don't beat yourself up if that's the case. Just come back again later, you know, study harder, study more. Um, spend more time with it, get more comfortable, and hopefully the next time it goes well for you. But as we said previously, all scores will come out on May 18th, whether or not you took the original dates or had to take one of the makeups. So if you're on the East Coast, that's 9 a.m. Eastern time. If you're on the West Coast, that is regrettably 6 a.m. Eastern time or 6 a.m. Pacific time. <laughs> I knew what you meant. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone knew what I meant, but apparently my brain didn't know the right words to say. And so that is the episode. I think this might be the shortest episode in history, John. So for that, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends. If you want to combine it with part one, we may be looking at the longest episode in history. No, the longest episode is that Logic Games recap we did of PG1. <laughs> it sure felt that way. I'm still <laughs> well, sore was. I know for a fact that was the longest episode in history. <laughs> 
All right. And that brings us to the end. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else that you may find it. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave us a comment and a rating as well. And we will certainly be doing a mailbag episode in coming days. So you can send questions that you have about the LSAT or law school admissions, or even this ABA kind of proclamation that we talked about in our last episode. Send those to LSATpodcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, stay safe out there and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.